question. <laughs> um, it's so lovely to see so many of you here, especially now that the pubs are open in England. So uh, we were we were worried that we'd lose a few numbers to that, uh, but it is wonderful to see you all. <laughs> um, this is our last event of our first ever time at Cambridge Tech and Society. Um, and we've had a great run so far with some fantastic events. I'm really excited for the discussion today um, with Melody, Lena, Tor and Fionn. And I'll introduce our panelists properly as the event uh, unfolds. Um, but we'll be discussing today data activism. Um, so when I was planning this event, I really, I realised that we needed about, we needed hours to talk to each of our panellists about the work that they do because they're coming from such different uh, perspectives within this board church that is data activism. Um, but since we're working on time constraints, um, I'm going to speak to each of them in turn to begin with, uh, more specifically about their work. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll broaden the discussion to include all of our panellists um, and we'll talk sort of more generally about um, the broader issues uh, that come up. Um, so just a word on questions, Q&A. Um, please just drop them into the chat box um, as and when they come to you. Um, and what I'll try and do is I'll uh, like try and integrate them into the discussion. Um, so I'll try and keep an eye on that. And also I think you can um, raise your hand as well. So everyone is most welcome to, to raise your hand. You can just speak um, into the discussion. That's fine also. Um, I'll keep an eye on that. Okay, um, so without further ado, um, I will introduce our first panellist, which is uh, Dr. Lena Denkick. Uh, hello, Lena, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Lena is the co-founder and director of the Cardiff Data Justice Lab, uh, where she researches as, and is involved in a number of projects on the interplay between the media and socio-political change, uh, and within this resistance, governance, and the politics of data. Uh, so welcome, Lena, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the first obvious question I have for you is what is data justice and why is it important? Okay, thank you very much for, for having me and a great initiative. It's really um, nice to see uh, these kinds of, of events um, being organized um, even, even during these times. So thanks very much and congratulations on, on a successful series of, of these types of events. Um, so in terms of sort of data, data justice, just to sort of give you um, an understanding of where that concept came from. So it emerged out of work that we had actually done on, on digital surveillance and particularly on uh, data-driven surveillance in the aftermath of the Snowden leaks in particular. And one of the things that we wanted to look at was a bit on how that issue was framed in terms of what is at stake with this increasing turn to data collection and use across our, our social life. And in, in that research, we found at that time that it was very much framed as an issue that what's at stake is a sort of trade-off between state security in this case, or, um, or efficiency is more often used now. And what we pay for with that is a sort of individual privacy and what's at stake is a sort of protection of personal data. And that had been the sort of way in which also civil society actors had engaged very much with those types of, of questions around what's happening with, with technology and, and particularly data intensive technology. And what we've wanted to do with the Data Justice Lab and with this concept of data justice was really to shift the terms of the debate to try and think about, well, actually probably that's too limited a framing for understanding what's at stake with uh, these types of technologies. And what we need to think about much more is how these kinds of developments relate to broader social justice questions and hence the term data justice. So it's really to try and, and shift it in terms of thinking about this, not just as a question of individual privacy, however important that is, but actually mobilize uh, in broader terms around how this connects to, for example, issues like discrimination, which has come up a lot uh, in more recent years, but also questions of inequality, democracy, like transparency, accountability, those types of questions, but also issues around you know, workers' rights, um, social rights, welfare rights, um, these kinds of, of questions that haven't had much airing really when it comes to um, activism around technology, which has tended to focus on, on these kinds of, of more immediate concerns around, around privacy and, and protection of personal data. So really data justice is a concept and an approach, if you like, that seeks to broaden and, and shift the terms of the debate and the type of mobilization we might need when engaging with these kinds of developments. And um, why do you think it is that um, we tend to think of these issues as quite individualistic? So when you're talking about privacy, uh, mm. why is it that we, we focus on that side of things? Um, I don't know if I have a reason as to, to why, but in, in terms of the research that we 
done, um, I mean, in one way, it's, it's not just um, how that's framed in public debate, but it's also how policies are, are framed around this. So, for example, something like the GDPR is based around an individual data subject. So that's a very rooted way in which we carry out policy, particularly in, in Europe. Um, so in that way, it, it sort of links to, to policy frameworks we have in place. And of course, that means that in terms of taking action, claiming individual rights to something is, is often the sort of more straightforward way of doing that. Um, but of course, the problem is that does that respond to the types of changes we're seeing and the kinds of, of implications that these kinds of developments actually have? Or do we need to actually um, try and create more collective action frames, if you like, um, that can engage with these um, more societal questions about what it means for inequality, for example, um, or what it means for, for say, um, work and, and the nature of work and, and, you know, even relationship between capital and labor, if you like. So I think um, those kinds of, of questions need to be there. But this turn to individual uh, actions is also I think when we did research with activists and, and also with ordinary citizens, as they're sort of referred to um, in academia, um, is, it was very much sort of um, a way in which of trying to uh, react or take control in what is often seen as a very disempowering um, kind of environment, you know, that people feel often that they're, they have frustrations and they feel things are unfair in, in terms of how technologies are being uh, developed and used but that there's little they can do about it, certainly on a collective level. And what they can do, perhaps, is to sort of reconfigure settings or choose not to go on certain platforms or whatever, which are quite sort of individualized acts. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about some of those harms you mentioned. Um, so you mentioned labour rights um, mm. and labour justice. Um, if you could perhaps elaborate on that. Yeah, so in terms of the research that we've done in, in the Data Justice Lab, we focused on sort of different areas, what we might think of sort of contentious areas where, um, you know, what's at stake is really our ability to participate or flourish in, in society. And so that's included things like public services, so being able to access things like welfare, for example, um, but also um, uh, the workplace and what it ha what, what's happening in the workplace, migration we've looked at, so the use of technologies, for example, in border control and, and in asylum processes, and also in, in law enforcement and policing, where it's been particularly contentious, the use of, of some of these technologies. Um, and in all of these areas, I think there are the sort of the immediate concerns that I think get a lot of focus, which is about the nature of the technology itself. So about the type of data collected, whether that's skewed because of historical practices that make these data sets skewed and how that leads to, to injustices. Um, also how the, you know, the technology is designed and developed, so the sort of algorithmic um, design and whether there are certain variables that lead to unjust outcomes. Um, those have been, a lot of focus has been around, around that within the sort of data justice field, if you like. But actually, I think what we're interested in as well is to think about how is it changing practices overall, by which I mean, how does it change how we understand problems and solutions? So, for example, in the workplace, does it change how we understand what productivity is, what it means to be a good worker, for example? Who does that favor and whose interest? Um, does it change how um, the ability for people in the workplace to um, to resist or to speak out or to challenge how they're managed, for example? Um, those kinds of questions, does it shift practices in terms of welfare? Does it, make it, um, does it make it more difficult to engage or challenge decisions that are made about you? Does it, you know, undermine democratic processes and those kinds of questions? And then also finally, just to sort of say what I think doesn't get talked about enough in this discussion around data justice is how it, the sort of broader power shifts. So what does it mean for us when we start relying on <clears throat> computational infrastructures that are often uh, developed and owned by um, by private companies, and what does that mean for for what kind of society we are we are establishing, right? Which are sort of bigger uh, questions about social justice in a kind of structural sense. Um, so, within that context that you've painted for us, how would you define what data activism actually is, um, and what are the kind of ways that we can organise um, politically? Yeah. I think it's it's difficult. I think you know there isn't just going to be one way uh, to address this. It will ha happens probably at different levels. And I think the kind of work that I've seen on on data activism focus on different things. In some senses, it's about you know um, turning these technologies on their heads. So I using them for advancing social justice, which I think is 
is how many people think of data activism. Can we, you know, use the same tools that are being used to oppress to emancipate, right? Is, is that a, a possibility? Of course, some argue that it, it's not precisely because of these things about that actually these technologies also change practices, they change how we understand problems and solutions. So in some instances, perhaps data activism needs to be about resisting technologies altogether in certain areas, right? So that, I guess, would be another way. So rather than appropriating technology, it's actually about putting down um, areas where we shouldn't be using these types of technologies at all, for example. Um, but it could also be developing alternative types of infrastructure, right? I think, for example, when it comes to this issue around private companies and, and the governance of uh, computational infrastructures and of data infrastructures, is it possible data activism has also been dedicated to, for example, developing something like cooperative platforms as alternatives to Uber and, and so forth, right? That would be one example of this, but also it could be something much, um, you know, it could be something much more kind of immediate to people in terms of, um, you know, signal as a different platform to communicate on that has better security and, and privacy enhancing and so forth, right? So I think it, it comes at these different levels. What I would say though is from a sort of data justice perspective, I think, what has been one of the issues is that they, they tend to still be sort of very confined to technology centric discussions that excludes a lot of communities who are actually impacted by these developments. For example, people who are active in, in something like um, anti-discrimination work or welfare rights work or, or workers rights work are often not part of these types of mobilizations that often. And I guess the challenge for us as sort of, if we wanna advance data activism is how to make those connection points between different parts of civil society, between different social movements, um, to actually mobilise a, a bigger, broader political movement. I think that might be a good time to introduce our um, next panellists, um, who very much are coming from the realm of um, tech design. Um, so we have Tor Newton and uh, Bjorn Carmen. I'm so sorry, I hope I pronounced those names right there. Um, the, uh, Tora and Bjorn, uh, they are experimental designers at uh, these art and tech design to change the way that we think about and make use of technology. Um, their projects are numerous and I would really recommend uh, you checking out their websites to have an explore of um, what they've been up to. Um, but to begin with, I really wanted to speak specifically about uh, Project Alias. Um, it's a recent project that you've collaborated on, um, which I think really sort of cuts to the heart of these issues about resistance with technology. Um, so, Tor and Bjorn, could you tell us a little bit about Project Alias? Um, what, what is it? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it would be good to give a bit of context. I think we, we both come from a very humanistic design approach. And when we got one of these devices in our homes, we perhaps were a bit critical, as many, with about privacy and how much control you actually have about these devices. So this is a Google Home, you might know them, speech control, etc. cetera. Um, and something we noticed quite early around these products and smart products that we're having now, increasingly in our private spheres, there isn't much out there that will actually give you that sense of um, agency and control over the device, similar to how we have a little plastic thing for your webcam right you can cover it <laughs> or if you have a window at the street as i do you can close the curtains and that was a bit missing in uh, back in what was this 2016 when we started researching this topic um so project alias kind of arrived from this frustration and this lack of control on this market and we started to think a lot about how we might hack something like the google home um, turns out it's really hard to hack. <laughs> it's a very enclosed system and that's of course another problem of tech products. They don't let you adjust or look inside. So there's no transparency. So we thought a lot about how we could create a more um, a smart hack that kind of uses the way it communicates. And it has some microphones. And that's how it picks up your voice. So Project Alias is, is actually a interference device that creates noise in the speakers and the microphones of the Google Home. Um, so at any time when you're talking or creating a command, it cannot actually it cannot hear you completely numb, it's paralyzed. And when you then need to call alias, it will then 
have its own trigger word. So the device we made is sort of a, has its own little local uh, algorithm that runs completely off the cloud. And it will recognize your custom created uh, keyword that will then cut the noise and, and activate the Google Home for you. So it kind of creates a, a very local controllable um, trigger. Um, I don't know if you want to add something there too, but something you might notice here when I put it on, it kind of looks looks a bit like a mushroom or organic. And the concept about alias has also arrived a lot from nature and the way parasites um, take over control from other species. Um, there's a quite beautiful analogy we found from cordyceps, which are a um, type of virus or uh, parasite in the, in the forest. Uh, Sorry, um, rainforest where you have a lot of species that, that fight for dominance and areas and control and we see the same thing in, in the tech world um, and whenever a species gets too powerful and too big uh, this this particular fungi the, the cordyceps will have a much higher chance to actually attack this particular species and then equalizing the power play in that little ecosystem so nature has already figured out how to balance these big companies um, <laughs> with a bit of fungi activism, and we wanted to bring fungi activism into the to the, the tech world right now. So we made, we made this little device. <laughs> but, um, sorry, to go on. No, I guess they're laughing off the the word fungus activism. Fungi oh, yeah. activism, yeah. <laughs> coin that. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, um, you've spoken about the democratization of AI. I can't, it was kind of implicit in what you were talking about to begin with, but if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, me and Bjorn both come from the world of interaction design and we are very interested in how you know humans relate to technology and can use technology um, and kind of, you know, interact with each other and the world around us through technology. And with the with the, the rise of a lot of these machine learning based um, tools and services that we have around us, um, that creates a very uh, for us very interesting topic to to try to understand what this technology have of potential and how it's used and how it uh, takes decisions for us in our everyday life. And you know we of course know. Um, I might heard how machine learning and AI is used in, you know, all kinds of services from our email inboxes to Netflix recommendations to, I mean, much bigger uh, ways to forecasting uh, economy stuff and um, web shops and uh, weather and so on. There's so many different topics that uh, machine learning is, is applied and what has been kind of a a missing area is to to take the the technology and put it more actively into everyday users' hands. Because what you often see is that people uh, are interacting with machine learning models very indirectly. So while you are picking a specific movie on Netflix, for example, you are actually training an algorithm on your choices and and your behavior. But it's not something you. It's like a byproduct of your action of choosing uh, a video in that case of Netflix and what me and Bjorn are very interested in and have been doing several projects around is how to take some of the the potential that comes with uh, machine learning uh, as a concept like the algorithmic power and put it more actively in the user's hands to try to um, really understand what it what it means to train an algorithm on your uh, uh, what can you say on the rules that you um, set yourself and not some service uh, somewhere defines what you can do. So for example, with Project Alias, it was uh, uh, the agency we wanted to play with there is the whole idea of uh, customizing the wake upward yourself, because that is uh, today controlled by Google or Amazon. I mean, they have a very specific word you need to say in order to interact with their device. Um, but with machine learning, it is possible to give that option to the user, for example, and uh, and be more in control of the devices you you own yourself, and you can start to to customize it and 
um, and take take more control. And there's there's different aspects to it we find important. One being that you you get to play with the same potential in a way uh, um, by by the, the rules you kind of want to create yourself and follow. And it also helps, um, I would say, open up the black box. You it's a more um, what can you say user friendly way to discover what these technologies does, how they work, and and what they can do. Yeah, it, um, it picks up on what Lena mentioned earlier about how quite often data access activism can feel like almost um, I mean, like a disempowering space because we're up against these huge corporations. So Project Alias is just a fantastic and like um, fun, I guess, way of kind of engaging with that and perhaps taking back some of that control. Um, one thing that strikes me, though, is that it is a reactive piece of kit. So like, it, you know, you've designed it in response to um, Google Homes and um, Amazon Echoes. So, um, so to what degree does this have sort of change making capacity, do you think? Mm. Um, it's funny because when we, when we come up with the, with the idea um, of, of making Project Alias, it was a very, as Bjorn mentioned earlier, you know, we wanted to, to hack, find a hack for the, for the Google Home. And that was a very technical discussion between me and Bjorn. Like, okay, how do we technical hack this thing when we cannot go inside of the product and, you know, move around with wires? Uh, and we found out of this, you know, system of making a, a mini, uh, I mean, actually using some of the same technology, just offline, not connected to the internet. And then we quite quickly had a solution um, to how to hack it. But we're also very aware, me and Bjorn, that Project Alias is not a solution to a problem because the problem uh, of privacy and, and data injustice is so wicked and complicated and complex that you will not be able to create an artifact to solve that. So Project Alias, from, from our perspective, is, is much more a communication device uh, and an art piece that is uh, disguised in a bit to live among real products, to make people um, react uh, and try to open you know open people's eyes a bit to what this topic is about mm. and i think that's what we, we experienced with project daily is because it was and has been perceived as a real thing that you could you could buy it has been very real for people and i think a lot of the work we normally do it uh, it maybe ends up on a specific block or a museum for other art interested people but what happened with project alias was that it got you know really got out in the mainstream medias and people who have no background or interest maybe normally in tech or art reacted to it and commented on it. And I think this um, wave, it was maybe part of moving at that point uh, in, in early 2019, is the, the whole awareness. Uh, and I think today that's the biggest impact that Alias uh, has done, is to, to just put it on the agenda uh, and the, being a topic for, for many more people to, to start discussing at the dinner tables or wherever. And I just start to discuss what does it actually mean to, um, to have such a device in your home that can listen to you. Yeah, and I would maybe add something to that. Um, you wrote, because we knew uh, we wouldn't actually try to sell it or make it a real product. We were sort of laying in between the realism and almost critical design and surrealism um, we were from the beginning designing it to be open source i think that's a really key part of democratizing ai and getting these algorithms out there so whatever we wrote we knew was supposed to be easy to replicate and um, at least for someone to also elaborate on it and take the code and improve and share as much as we could um, so that has been a principle from the get-go. Yeah. I think it really taps into um, this idea that people do have a subliminal awareness of privacy and data concerns. I think like Alias doesn't let you get away with that um, kind of apathy, I suppose, that a lot of people sort of go through life with. So yeah, I thought it was really successful in that. Um, I think probably at this moment I will now talk to um, Melody Patry. Um, so Melody, thanks again for, um, for joining us. Um, 
Uh, just to introduce you, um, Melody spent her career campaigning across human rights issues, um, across from women's rights to free speech and privacy. Um, she is now Advocacy Director at Access Now, um, which seeks to defend the internet and the rights of those who use it. Um, so welcome. Um, my first question is, um, what does it mean to defend the internet? Um, so we actually changed a lot of our mis mission statement in the past few years, because at first we we're talking more about digital rights and we're still talking about digital rights, but increasingly, first of all, a lot of people did not really know what digital rights were. So there is still actually a lot of awareness that we need to do when it comes to privacy online, um, even freedom of expression online to some extent. So instead, today we're talking a lot more about human rights in the digital age. And the reason for that is because our lives are so uh, intertwined with new technologies. We, it's sometimes impossible even to dissociate um, offline and online, even when we want to. I mean, the, the, the current COVID-19 pandemic has put in place lots of restrictions, but also some of the solutions put forward uh, were through new technologies and some of these uh, solutions have become compulsory with you know, like you have to download uh, a tracking app, you have to agree to some terms and conditions that probably most people don't read. So yes, fighting for the internet today is making sure that first of all the human rights that we're supposed to benefit offline are replicated and respected in the online world and that the internet which initially the the, the core values of the internet are around openness um you know like connection across borders and so on are still ref protected and especially at the time when i think there are a lot of threats to the internet. So whether uh, we're talking about censorship online, whether we're talking about the inf internet infrastructure itself, we're seeing a lot of countries, unfortunately, wanting to regain control over some of the freedoms um, of the internet and some of the rights that people have not necessarily gained, but have been able to exercise a bit better thanks to the internet. Um, and, and we're seeing a clampdown in some countries or in some regions with now even the, um, the emergence of what we call the splinternets, which is when nations want to develop their own internet infrastructure so that they can control it, so that they can shut it down whenever they want, so that they can cut access to the global internet uh, of their, their citizens. So the phenomenon of internet shutdowns, for example, has completely escalated in the past three years, especially around uh, key democratic moments like elections, protests, where we're seeing uh, either complete internet blackouts. So when all of a sudden it's like you turn the light off, uh, but instead you turn the internet off. And sometimes to do that, actually you do turn the light off, like you, you cut uh, access to the electricity. But um, we're seeing more and more sophisticated ways to sh shut down the internet or to at least try to control access to some um, avenues and some channels of the internet. So um, at Access Now, we've been working a lot on that issue, trying to even work prevent preemptively before a shutdown happen, or when we know that a shutdown is very likely, we're trying to make um, support affected communities by explaining, you know, how to use a VPN when it's a, a shutdown that is only affecting specific services, you know, like platforms, uh, messaging services, and so on. Um, we're collecting testimonies so that people understand the real life impact of internet shutdowns. And we're also acting at the, at the policy level and at the um, legal level as well. So for example, we're trying to encourage positive uh, legal framework to protect our rights, so especially around data protection, privacy, um, content governance, which most people know through uh, content moderation, which is one aspect of content governance. Um, and then, you know, when, when we feel like uh, we, we can, 
uh, we also take legal um, legal measures so we can enter into litigation to try to fight back if we feel like uh, our rights are, are being threatened or have been curtailed. Um, could you just describe for the layman who governs the internet and what the um, geopolitics of that is? Yeah, sure. So um, it's, I mean, who's got the internet? I think we don't have the time to do a, a full geography of access to the internet because what we notice is that actually even in countries that are super connected so if we take the example of the uk here or the us or, or other countries uh, in india for example that is providing you know so many uh, engineers to to the world you also have pockets of people that are complete or communities that are completely disconnected um, for me, it, I always cannot believe it when I go to some areas in London and I don't have a uh, mobile service. <laughs> um, so, you know, or, or all of a sudden I don't have 3G, I'm on edge and so on. And I'm like, but hang on, this is London. So you can only imagine what it means to some rural communities in the country and then to some other countries where the infrastructure is not as developed. So there is still, when we talk about data injustice, there is still access is still obviously uh, a, um, a key issue is about how we can really democratize access to the internet and an access that is affordable for everyone because it's not just having the infrastructure it's also for people being able to afford infrastructure and that's actually what we had noticed when we were sometimes um helping people out uh, who were people who were affected by internet shutdowns that, that were partial shutdowns so censorship of specific platforms we were putting forward um, vpns as a solution but in some countries data data is so expensive and sometimes vpns are using a bit more data so it was becoming an unaffordable solution for people to circumvent uh, the, the current internet shutdown. So all of this has to be taken into account. And then um, beyond just access, we also need to think about the rights that we have and the protections that we have or that we don't have when we connect to the internet. So the level of surveillance now that is um, operated on the internet, whether it's by governments or by private actors, I would say that to some extent, sometimes, you know, the likes of Amazon and Google have more information about us than our own uh, governments and they're also, you know, unelected and uh, unrepresented. So um, we also have to take this into account. Some services also have policies that can threaten people or discourage people from using the internet. Um, thinking, for example, of Facebook real name policy you know, in some countries where you can end up in jail for just expressing uh, your opinions online, you can immediately see how having uh, your real name on, on, on Facebook can be problematic. Um, I think just today we learned that one of the uh, leaders of the Hong Kong protest has been sentenced to 11 months to prison uh, for organizing a protest he did so you know using the internet mobilizing people uh through the internet so all of these policies also have a, an impact on who can access the internet and what are the consequences for for using the internet and then of course i cannot not mention some of the issues that lena also touched on in her presentation around you know bias when it comes to the development of technologies and who they are built by and who they are built for, uh, who they exclude, who they forget, uh, who they mix up. Uh, and so this issue is also the, the representation in tech development has real life impact when we are talking about, you know, machine learning and algorithms, um, you know, facial recognition technologies has been proven now to, um, make a lot of errors when it came to identifying, for example, black people in the US and a lot of uh, black people were uh, first being arrested for having committed a crime that they had never 
uh, committed and so all of, all of these um, all of these factors <laughs> I say would play a, a part in the internet ecosystem and how our rights are protected or neglected online. You've answered a lot of the uh, questions I had for you there. Um, I guess uh, one I've got is, is what are the solutions here um, to these issues that Access Now are confronting? Is it, is it like a regulation based um, strategy that we should be focusing on? Yeah, so it's very difficult to talk about uh, solutions, especially global solutions and, and uh, solutions at scale. And what we've been learning in the in the past few years, for example, is that we do not always have the solutions. Sometimes a lot of the work that we do is damage control. <laughs> um, I think in, in, in some aspects, yes, regulation and legal framework is a solution. I mean, for data protection, it's been obvious. I know that a lot of people are, are, are dreading the the acronym GDPR, you know, like the the European Data Protection um, regulating framework that has been implemented in Europe but has had consequences beyond Europe because um, uh, people, not just who are operating in Europe but who are normally uh, receiving European visitors, are supposed to respect. Uh, data protection of, of European users. So we, we've seen how that has completely changed the data protection online uh, for, for users. And so that's a case where regulation definitely is, I think, playing a key part. And then implementation has to go and enforcement has to uh, complete that because if you know that you're not going to be able to uh, check if a regulation is being implemented and how it's being implemented. You have a few, I mean, fewer chances of, of that regulation uh, from being respected. But it, it's not always the answer. I mean, in, in, in some context, we already have mechanisms, we already have laws and, 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 and other frameworks that are respecting rights. They're just not respected because there is complete impunity. That's very often the case for internet shutdowns. I think that um, internet shutdowns, for example, are a, a blatant vi violation of the right to freedom of expression, uh, as well as the right to information, sometimes the right to assembly and, and other rights. And that right, beyond being a, an international um, recognized human right, it's also a right that is enshrined in most constitutions and con countries that are protecting those rights in their constitution still manage to, to, to abuse it and to, to violate it because they have total impunity when they, when they do it. Telecommunication companies that are complying with uh, shutdown orders are not always challenging those orders. They're not even checking if the order uh, to shut down the internet is constitutional or, or, or abide by the law or made in a in a context that is uh, respectful of, of the law. So yeah, solutions, we do have some. I don't want to be all gloomy and, <laughs> and depressing for, for this. I think that there's, there has been a lot of work when it comes to policy making, uh, awareness campaigns. We've been, we've been really winning a, a lot of battles, but there is so much to be done. And sometimes it's difficult to make a case when, um, you're you're fighting against sometimes even convenience so you know like some sometimes uh i know i i i have failed for example to get all of my friends and family to enable two-factor authentication on their account you know like even on their email account uh, and, and so on because they they see this as a burden they see this as, as something that is not necessarily user friendly and so in that case uh how do we how yeah how do we get the balance right between you know convenience and and human rights between convenience and protection it's um i think as as advocate as digital rights advocate we still have a lot of work to make those points clear and to make our point uh, come across of the the importance of those rights being respected even if it means that you have to take a little bit more time or that you maybe disable some of the functionalities of your, the technology around you. 
we're all a bit guilty of that really <laughs> fair to say um i think at this point what i'd like to do is um broaden the discussion so um we can all get involved um please uh ask questions amongst yourselves um raise points um whatever you think is is valuable to raise at this point i think perhaps a good idea would be to kick off with the question we've just had in the chat um from martin who has asked how do we get the balance right between privacy um, so the issue that you mentioned, Melody, about uh, Facebook real names uh, policy um, and with accountability. So um, the anonymous social media trolls and debate with anonymous persons can be extremely poisonous. Yeah. So, um, so how do we get that balance right? So I've just spoken, but <laughs> uh, I'll give this a go. It's, it's a difficult balance. What the studies have shown is that actually real name policy does not prevent trolls. Uh, it does not. Uh, it is not a solution to racism, to sexism, and so on. And people sometimes feel protected not just by a fake name, but also by a screen. And um, most of the studies that have been done in the past few years have have not been um successfully showing that a real name policy is a, a deterrent to to social media trolling it can be a bit it, it can be seen as, as as more trustworthy and i would totally understand that but then the cost it's always also about like a cost privilege um a, a calculation of um the the Sorry, I'm, I'm looking for my word. The advantage versus the, or, or, or do we have to compromise? And so far, I would say that the, the cost of real name policy has been more uh, discouraging for not just activists, but also uh, a lot of the people who will often end up being the target of trolls can also be, um, can also be discouraged. So when we see like, not just activists, but also communities that are being uh, excluded from from some debates or or are facing lots of harass harassment uh, when we see some communities using for example uh, uh, a performing name and so on like that like real name policy is not helping them so I agree that I'm not dismissing the danger and and the uh, the 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 nefast uh, consequences of of online trolling and harassment. These issues have to be tackled, but I I believe that in this case there are other solutions that are more efficient to to tackle those better um, better moderation, better um, content removal by real person, uh, and not just by by bots or by algorithm. Uh, that would be what we what we recommended. I don't know if any of our uh, panel. Oh, Brian, go on. I have a question. It's perhaps more for Melody or Lina. Um, in a world where we see that the tech industry changing fast and you know being designed to create new change every week and every month, new products, and on the flip side, having the legislation and the law having a hard time following that speed. Um, how, can we, how can we have legislation keep up? And I guess also um, how can we as normal people, as activists help speed up that, that process? Um, how do we smaller that gap um, currently? I can take a some, uh, some of that, I mean, in terms of, obviously, that's a very difficult question around uh, sort of um, uh, the way that follows, like that, uh, that policy or law has to catch up with technology. I would also say it's careful to accept it, right, because it's, mm. it's conveniently and strategically used by, by um, big tech to, um, you know, avoid any regulation. I mean, that's been the whole premise of companies like Uber and so forth, right? So let's just enter and create markets where there's no regulation and then it's too late to regulate once they're in place, right? So we should be very careful to accept those kinds of things, although I appreciate that it is um, um, a, a dilemma. But I would say that there are certain 
um, certain things where I think we actually have, and this is where I guess I come back to the sort of data justice frame, which is very much about drawing on, on things that perhaps aren't in the purview of technology debates as they are at the moment that could address some of these more sort of um, structural things. So for example, thinking about um, uh, you know, democratic process and policy process and what we have in place. Because if you think about the sort of role that these companies have now, they're effectively in many cases becoming governance structures. So something like the pandemic has made that very clear where, you know, um, something uh, companies like Apple and Google can effectively dictate how health policy should be carried out through setting standards, right? And these are, as Melody also mentioned, unaccountable actors. But actually, you know, we could say that Surely we, we have institutional processes in place that make that kind of power or that kind of power needs to be uh, rapidly um, addressed, right? That's not aligned with how we understand what democracy is for, for uh, private and corporate actors to have that type of, of governance effect. Um, and that we see it replicated in other areas. I mean, in the UK, um, at the moment, we have a companies like Palantir as well, which is a software analytics company um, being contracted with the NHS to set up a data superstore, uh, as they call it, which effectively will mean that lots of health policy will become dependent on the analysis and insights provided by Palantir as a private software analytics company. That is a huge question about then what happens to governance, what happens to the ability for governments to actually maintain um, the, the power to, to make policies. Um, so, and I think those are not going to be technology, those aren't going to be addressed by data protection regulation, for example, and things like that, but there might be um, other avenues that address those questions from a democratic angle. But I will say like in our research, we've done a bit of research on civic participation. The issue for civil society generally, of course, is this whole, and you mentioned as well, that it's a reaction to always, it's always a response to a harm that has already been carried, happened, or it's about, as Melody talked about, mitigating some of the harms that, that are emerging from these kinds of technologies. And of course, it would require really big sort of structural changes uh, in terms of, of how these companies, um, the power these companies now have uh, in order to sort of do preemptive forms of regulation. But, um, but yeah, this is just one way of thinking about it. Yeah, and just okay. oh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so I was just going to add that one thing that we've been, uh, I think, preaching for, for quite some time now is also what we call human rights by design, where we basically ask uh, companies to integrate human rights at the design, at the very like early stages of, of conception and development and not as an addendum after there's already been a breach or after there's already been a legal, you know, like after there's mm. already been an issue. And we know that, uh, you know, some people call this a bit like kumbaya or wishful thinking for, for us to, to convince, um, especially big tech, but it, it's really for any tech, like big or small, they should take those human rights consideration into consideration, uh, at the very early stages of, of development. And sometimes they will get it wrong. Sometimes it's true that you, you cannot always um, get ahead the, the, the various consequences that a product can have on human rights. But at least if you do have almost like a human rights checklist uh, at, at the very early stage, we believe that a lot of harms that we are seeing today could have been prevented. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I, I guess it's also um, to some to some uh, aspect also acknowledge that it you know big companies will also fail and mistakes will happen, but the big issue is if responsibility is not uh, acknowledged or if if you clearly did a mistake but you push the responsibility away from you as a company like and I. Um, there's many examples of that, of course, where it's also someone tried to, I don't know, maybe achieve or solve a problem, and then by solving a problem, they created, I don't know, five new problems that were bigger. And, and I think that is, it can always be hard to, in some areas, to, what can you say, predict that. But the big issue or the big damage is if you 
leave away your responsibility to fix those problems that you ended up creating. Um, we've got another question here in the chat, um, which is what do you think the solution is to large scale content moderation, um, human moderators versus AI, who is responsible? Um, I can try to provide a, an answer to this, although we recently published a paper on that and it's 40 pages long. <laughs> so uh, just to say that, yes, content moderation, I think nobody still has found the miracle solution to this, especially for large scale content moderation. If I give the example recently um, of Ethiopia, we've been seeing some um content that should have been removed for example by by facebook and we believe that it is the responsibility of facebook when content that is a direct threat to people's life when they are direct incitement to violence direct incitement and targeted and and you know like credible uh incitement to violence uh the, that content should be removed and there were many reasons why that content uh, was not removed in a in a timely manner and and represented a, a real threat to to a community. And so, in that case, more resources need to be allocated to language and translation so that moderators have the ability to review content that is being flagged to them. There's sometimes the issue that um, content removal, for example, or content moderation, relies either on a as, as we say, like AI or as a um, crowdsource. So for example, people need to report a lot and that can also be skewed because then you could have uh, basically a little army mass reporting legitimate content and then that legitimate content ends up being removed. So, I mean, large scale content moderation, I think is so complicated because it, it it has so many layers um, and as much as AI can be effective to operate at scale, it, it hasn't proved intelligent enough to do a good job in, in content moderation. So for example, AI is good at recognizing, uh, for example, uh, um, child pornography very often. Uh, AI is not good at recognizing racism or, or sexism or irony uh, or satire and so that has been i think the the biggest issue we, we still do rely a lot on human moderators they have to be trained they have to be protected uh from like all the trauma that they're being exposed to um because so far uh ai has has not been a the appropriate tool to to large-scale content moderation and it requires a lot of resources and a lot of money and that's something that is not always at the top priority of um, of uh, big platforms. Um, I would just add, um, just on the, Melly knows much more about content moderation than, than I do, but um, just, um, I think one issue is again, and it comes back again to this question, like what, what role do we think um, something like Facebook should have? Is it appropriate for Facebook to decide what uh, content should be allowed on a platform, on its platform as it were, considering the impact that that pl platform has on, on societies around the world? And I think increasingly the consensus seems to be that it isn't appropriate for Facebook to decide what type of content it should have on its, its platform. It should actually be an independent authority of some kind um, and of course, that makes it complicated on a global scale, as, as Melody also mentioned and mentioned before. How do we do that um, on a global scale? But it does raise the question on the list that certainly it does make it more just that, that Facebook is the is the arbiter of what is appropriate and not appropriate for for the global population to be um, sharing. I'm just aware we're running out of time here a little bit. So perhaps um, if we go into the last question, hopefully one that might leave us with a bit, um, something positive to leave with, I suppose. Um, I wanted to know what capacity um, there is for tech and tech activism to work in solidarity with broader social justice causes, because these things are so interrelated. And certainly there are some projects from Tor and Bjorn that really spring to mind here um, with the work that you've done. Um, so yeah, could you leave us with a hopeful note, please? <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, well, we can try. <laughs> um, I think with every new, um, I mean, what can you say, technology or aspect that, that speaks into how we live our lives, there is, um, you know, many different futures to take and, and we might be presented to, to one. Um, and, and of course, often that is by the big uh, the companies and, and innovation uh, and, and often also that in, in a capitalistic system who have been pulling towards a, a different or a specific um, like future. Um, but I think with both tech and activism and art as well, um, is really the, what can you say, the, the opportunity to, to ask questions um, and have a room for, for not only thinking in uh, solutions, but also challenges the way we, we, we currently live. Um, and I think that is something that we can never get enough of. We can never have too, too many uh, suggestions to how uh, the future, our current state, uh, and how we can relate to stuff can be, can be otherwise. And um, I think both with uh, yeah, different communities, open source, and um, uh, what can I see? In a connected world, we, we also get many more uh, of these suggestions uh, than we ever had before. And I definitely see that as a positive thing. Hmm. I would maybe add something that makes me really hopeful, especially teaching a lot on design schools and interaction design students. Um, I've increasingly noticed that a lot more are aware of ethics and issues that Melody brought up and I think you're totally right designers have to shift perspective they're not longer just creating something beautiful or something that functions but they're sort of in that line from technician to engineer to the economy and the store and that who is it in that production line that questions the ethics and and I think that has to happen early as you said, Melanie, and um, I see that role changing as designers, and I would encourage everyone working in design and, and bring up that conversation with the station, of course, and the industry. But um, yeah, I see I see a new generation being much more aware and being much more proactive and engaged on these topics that they perhaps weren't so much before. And I think empowering those new roles are important. Um, giving them the voice and giving them the tools to actually prevent and discuss early enough. That's something that makes me hopeful. I, can I add a sort of also hopeful, I think, like an example of, of just to show, I think, that it's possible to push back or to succeed um, in, in terms of sort of from a data justice perspective, I would say, so I mean, Melody mentioned, for example, facial recognition and, and issues around that in uh, particularly focused on, on the US. I mean, that has been in many ways a success story for community activism in particular, uh, because what we've had is, is actually the banning of the use of facial recognition technologies in law enforcement um, in several different uh, cities and states in the United States. And that's not come out of some sort of enlightenment that just happened all of a sudden that, oh, hang on, maybe this is discriminatory. That came from ongoing longstanding community campaigns that were rooted in broader social justice concerns about existing, uh, you know, discrimination, violence by police against, uh, against communities within the US. It was tied up with how, you know, economic distribution, how certain communities were being neglected um, within the US and that spatial recognition technology was brought in as a way to solve crime um, in, these, in these areas when actually clearly it does none of that. Um, so it was really the fact that they succeeded to unite and push for then the banning of spatial recognition technology use by law enforcement is, is a huge success story that I think we can learn a lot from and particularly in the UK we could learn a lesson or two from because it hasn't happened here. Okay, uh, thank you so much um, for joining us today. It's a really, really interesting discussion. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, we'll have to finish up now. Oh, we've got um, a hand up actually. Um, is it all right if we take that? Um, I know Lena, you 
perhaps had something you need to get onto. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I will, um, I have to go and do the dinner, so I will uh, run up. Um, but um, uh, it was really nice chatting with you and uh, thank you very much again for, for thanks, your time. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you. Oh, it was just a thank you. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> uh, thanks, Lena, as well. <laughs> um, just quickly before everyone goes, um, just as I mentioned, that was the last uh, event of term with CTS, um, but we'll be back after Christmas with some exciting new ventures and events. Uh, we're going to put our heads down and get some things ready for you. Um, we've currently got a workshop in the pipeline um, with the Amnesty Data Verification Corps, and they're really interesting because they, um, they sort of troll social media and verify human rights abuse. Um, data so um i think at the moment they're looking at tear gas um at, like episodes of uh, using tear gas in protests in places like hong kong so really important stuff um we're also looking at uh, putting together a research round table um with people from across the university uh just to sort of chip in and tell us what you're up to because um, i think it's really interesting uh so if that sounds like a bit of you then please do get in touch um and we're always excited to have people re reach out to us um um, thanks again to um, Lena who's gone, Melody, Tor and Bjorn, um, really interesting discussion um, and I hope you all have a lovely Christmas. So thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.